Howdy! Welcome to Wendy's Classic Corner. I'm Wendy and today I want to talk about westerns. I want to start out by mentioning that if you missed any of our shows, you can always catch all our episodes on my YouTube channel, Wendy's Classic Corner. You can also do a search for Wendy's Classic Corner on PCTV21.org under the Watch Live tab. If you are interested in appearing to be on the show to talk about classic film, please follow me on my Wendy's Classic Corner Facebook page. Now, let's turn our attention to a very popular genre of film, westerns. In fact, westerns are a genre of film that are still prevalent today. What is it about westerns that stand the test of time? Westerns have a strong appeal to audiences. They are usually full of action and generally entertaining. They explore themes of individualism, violence, and the struggle for survival, which are universal and timeless. In fact, Westerns have been around almost as long as film itself. One of the first Westerns was The Great Train Robbery from 1903, which was a silent film. This film features bandits that rob a train and engage in gunfights, which is a common theme in Westerns. In fact, even before the advent of moving pictures, Plays would feature cowboys and outlaws even in the late 1800s, so you can certainly say westerns have stood the test of time. Of course, the portraying Native Americans as evil villains in the majority of early westerns is rather problematic. There was some objection to this even in the 50s and 60s, with certain stars such as Marlon Brando complaining not only about the way Native Americans were being portrayed in film, but also the fact that Native Americans were played by white actors in makeup that made them look Native American. Regardless of these complaints, the Cowboys versus Indians theme was extremely popular and prevalent in classic Westerns. Today, I want to discuss two of my favorite Westerns, both of which are not your usual style of Westerns, but are still amazing films in the Western genre. I'll start with my favorite, 310 to Yuma. This film was remade again in 2007, but in my opinion, nothing beats the original. The strength in this film is in the acting, the cinematography, and the character development throughout the film. The film is also suspenseful and can possibly con be considered in the Western noir genre as well. This film features one of my favorite actors, and in my opinion, possibly one of the greatest ever, Van Heflin. Not a big name actor by any means, Van Heflin is genius in his natural portrayals of his characters. He's brilliant in this film and almost, almost perfectly matched by the acting of Glenn Ford. In fact, the majority of the film is a tense emotional duel between Heflin and Ford, and it's extremely effective. The cinematography in this film is equally effective and beautifully done. Shot on location in Arizona, the barren terrain with its beautiful rock formations provide a gorgeous backdrop. Our cinematographer on this film was Charles Lawton Jr., who was the cinematographer in the Orson Welles film noir, The Lady from Shanghai. You can see some of the Orson Welles influences in this film, such as low camera angles in several of the shots in the hotel room with Heflin and Ford. The George Dunning score also works very well in keeping the tension throughout. There is a title song, The 310 to Yuma, which was written by Dunning and is sung at the beginning and the end of the film. This film was directed by Delmore Davis, who directed such films as Dark Passage and Price of the Pride of the Marines. This film begins with Ben Wade, who's played by Glenn Ford's gang, rab robbing a stagecoach. This is unintentionally wished, witnessed by Dan Evans, who was played by Van Heflin, and his two sons, who are looking for their runaway cattle. The cattle are scattered all around the stagecoach scene. As the robbery is progressing, the stagecoach driver grabs one of the bandits from the gang and holds him at gunpoint in the hopes that the rest of the gang will go away. However, Ben merely shoots the guy that's held hostage and then shoots the driver with no apparent concern. Ben then takes Dan's horses so he and the boys can't go for the sheriff, and Ben and his gang race off to the nearest town. 
The boys are upset with their father for just standing by while these crimes are being committed, and when they return home, Dan's wife also seems to feel similarly. Meanwhile, Ben and the gang have come to a nearby town to have some drinks at a saloon. There's a pretty bartender, Emmy, who Ben ta ha takes a liking to. He reports the stagecoach robbery and killing to the marshal as if he was an innocent bystander in the matter. The marshal begins to round up a posse to try to track down the bandits. It's quickly discovered, though, that the bandits are actually Ben's gang. Th by this time, Ben has sent most of his gang off in different directions, and he remains in the town solely to enjoy Emmy's company. One of the stagecoach passengers, the owner of the stagecoach, has come to town to help apprehend Ben. Unfortunately, as the other posse members become aware of who they are dealing with, Ben Wade's gang, they drop out one by one. The marshal asks Dan, who has come to town to try to get a loan, to help them capture Ben. Dan is resistant, but he agrees to trap Ben, which he does successfully. Now it's up to the marshal to get Ben on the 310 train going to Yuma. Dan refuses to continue on, but when the stagecoach owner offers $200, he immediately volunteers. They devise a clever plan to throw the rest of the gang off the track by taking Ben in a stagecoach and pretending to have the stagecoach break down around Dan's house. While fixing the stagecoach, Ben is covertly taken from the stagecoach into Dan's house, and the repaired stagecoach goes off with the gang members following. Ben has dinner with Dan's wife and sons, and he is quite charming with them, learning that Dan is in trouble on his farm because of an unrelenting drought. Once it is deemed safe, Ben is transported back to the hotel to wait out its time to go to the train. Most of the remainder of the film takes place in the hotel room in a standoff between Ben and Dan. It's the best part of the film, with Ben playing all sorts of psychological games with Dan. This is where the character development begins to become obvious, with Dan going from someone who is only in it for the money to doing it because it is morally right, refusing double and more the amount to let Ben go. We also see Ben is not quite as cold and calculating as he appears in the beginning. He seems to genuinely like Dan and not want him to be hurt. The climax of the movie is a long scene with Dan walking Ben to the train, surrounded by all the gang trying to kill him. This is an amazing film, to me, probably the greatest Western out there. You can't really beat Van Heflin and Glenn Ford facing off in this film, and as I said, the film has a lot of noirish elements, shadows, smoke, and angled camera shots. I highly recommend you give 310 to Yuma a try. And don't forget to check your local library. If the film isn't at your local library, just ask a librarian to order it for you from another library in the system. The next Western I want to discuss is a rather obscure film, The Sea of Grass, 1947. It's a little bewildering to me why this film is not more well known. The film stars Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, who would be paired together in a total of nine films, most romantic comedies. However, there is nothing comical about this particular film. It is directed by the master of angst, Ilya Kazan, and reflects the usual social issues common to Ilya Kazan films. In fact, this caused a lot of headaches between Kazan and producer Pandro Berman, who wanted a more typical Western. Kazan was for further annoyed because he was not allowed to shoot on location and instead had to use stock footage of the Sea of Grass, which had been shot on the prairies of Nebraska. Kazan was so upset about the final product that he encouraged people not to see the film. I, on the other hand, do encourage you to see the film. The acting is impressive and interesting, and it's interesting to see Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy in more serious roles. Catherine is a bit affected in this film for my taste, especially in the beginning. This film also features a great supporting cast with Melvin Douglas, Harry Carey, and Robert Walker. The film gives you a good glimpse of the characters' personalities right from the start, with Ludi, played by Catherine Hepburn, in St. Louis preparing for her wedding to Jim Bruton, Spencer Tracy. While with her father, she receives a telegram from Jim telling her he cannot attend and for her to travel by train to South Fork, New Mexico. Ludi complies. However, the train arrives early in South Fork and no one is there to meet her. Ludi has made a friend on the train, a woman and a child that are from the area, but the woman's husband comes and takes her home. Ludi is used to city life of St. Louis and finds Salt Fork a bit of a shock. Nevertheless, she takes herself off to the closest hotel to get out of the sun and make inquiries. 
There she meets Bryce Chamberlain, played by Melvin Douglas, and asks about Jim. Unfortunately, Bryce is not a fan of Jim's, nor are a good many folks in the town. Jim is a cattle baron with a huge amount of land and refuses to allow people to settle on the land to farm and make a living. In fact, he's involved in a lawsuit where some of the men, some of his men shot a homesteader who was squatting on his land. Much to Bryce's disgust, there is a clear good old boy system working here and the men are set free. Jim takes Ludie home and introduces her to the household, who at first are a bit standoffish with her but quickly become very fond of her. She also charms Jim's friends, especially Doc, played by Harry Carey. Jim shows her his sea of grass and explains why it's so important to preserve it. Basically, Jim believes that God has the grass there for the purpose of raising cattle and that farming will destroy the grass and the climate will destroy the crops planted and leave nothing. He's completely against homesteaders on his property, which he gained by fighting the Native Americans and also lost his brother to in the process. The shots of the grass are particularly, particularly impressive with the wind rippling through them and they do indeed look like waves on an ocean. Ludi tries to understand Jim's attitude, but when her friend from the train, Selena, needs a place to live with her husband and child, Ludi convinces Jim to let them live on his land. He agrees, but warns her that it can't last. Otherwise, things are good on the ranch, with Ludi's giving birth to a daughter, Sarah Beth. Things go awry when a blizzard comes through and Jim is away with the cattle. Some of the cattle on the ranch cross the fence put up by Selena's husband. He rushes out to protect his land and crops from the cattle and winds up getting severely beaten by the cowboys. Selena drags him into the house and then loses her baby because of the exertion. Ludi is devastated by all this and goes to see them only to be told they don't want to have anything to do with her and are leaving. Ludi shares her anguish with Jim only to receive an I told you so type response which infuriates her. It causes her to leave Jim for a period of time. She goes up to Denver and there she runs into Bryce who has been in the background the entire time as a very interested party. Frustrated and upset, she has an affair with Bryce which she immediately regrets. Ludi returns to Jim who is happy to have her back but does not change his attitude at all. Ludi winds up giving birth to a baby boy and in her delirium during labor says certain things that led on to the household staff and that perhaps Jim is not the father of the child. Jim also has misgivings, although Doc convinces him that Ludi was just out of her mind. Bryce winds up getting the federal government behind him and the homesteaders are allowed to make claims to live on Jim's land. Jim res Jim's response to this is to get a posse to shoot the homesteaders. Ludi tries desperately to stop him, but it finally comes out about the affair between Bryce and Ludi and that Brock, her son, is indeed Bryce's son. Jim tells her to leave and to leave both children and that he will raise Brock as his own son. She complies. Jim takes his posse to shoot the trespassers, but is met by an old friend who is leading an army regiment. Jim is told that the army is sent to keep the peace and that his men would suffer the loss of their lives if he persists. Jim doesn't want this and is resigned to accept the homesteaders. There's a great deal of sub subtle character development in Spencer Tracy's character as he is forced to accept a new way of life. The townspeople know of the rumor about Brock not being his son, which causes a lot of problems for Brock. Ludi tries to keep tabs on her children from afar. At first, the homesteaders flourish with their crops, but after a while, Jim's predictions turn out to be correct. An event occurs which devastates the Bruton household. You may want to have a box of Kleenex ready for the end of this film. It's quite moving. Melvin Douglas and Spencer Tracy are both particularly good in this, as is Robert Walker in the small role of Brock as a young man. Ilya Kazan specializes in young person angst, and you have lots of it in Brock. Though not a typical Western, there's a common Western conflict of cowboys versus homesteaders. This is a theme with several Westerns. There's also a theme of preservation of nature, and it's heartbreaking to see the beautiful early scenes of the plateaus of grass as opposed to later scenes of barren wasteland. I hope you will see this film, The Sea of Grass. Hello. Sounds good, send them in. Well, folks, it's time to hear what our viewers have to say.
first up, we have Brian, who is visiting us in the studio today. Hi, Brian. What Western film do you want to talk about? Hi, Wendy. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to talk about uh, John Ford's 1959 film, The Horse Soldiers. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about the plot. Yeah. So, uh, well, this film, as I said, was directed by John Ford, and it stars uh, John Wayne, William Holden, and Constance Towers in her first leading role in a film. And um, it combines elements of two genres that, that John Wayne's really known for, um, the Western, obviously, um, but also war films. And um, this, is, this film is loosely based on a 1956 novel, also called The Horse Soldiers by Harold Sinclair. And that uh, book is a sort of a fictionalized account of an actual historical event that, that happened during the American Civil War called uh, Grierson's Raid. And so this was a Union cavalry raid that happened during the 1863 Vicksburg campaign. Um, so it borrows elements from, from that, um, that actual event, but kind of uh, changes a few things. Um, so in this, John Wayne plays Colonel uh, Marlowe, who is a Union cavalry officer sent behind Confederate lines to um, uh, destroy a railroad and a, a supply depot at a place called Newton Station. And um, his character is loosely based on the historical uh, Colonel Grierson that the, the raid is named after. Um, and William Holden plays a character called uh, Major Henry Kendall, who is a regimental surgeon. And him and uh, Colonel Marlowe often butt heads in the film. Um, we find out at one point in the film that this is because uh, Colonel Marlowe's uh, wife had died and he blames doctors for this. So some of that is kind of... Uh, anger that he is placing on uh, uh, Major Kendall just because of the fact that he's a doctor. Um, and so there's uh, one point where their unit rests at a plantation called uh, Greenbrier Plantation, and the mistress of the plantation, uh, Miss Hannah Hunter, who is played by uh, Constance Towers, she at first is sort of portraying herself as a gracious host to, to these soldiers who um, have found themselves at her doorstep. Um, but as we find out, her intentions really aren't so innocent. Uh, there's a scene where, um, where Marlowe and the other officers are meeting to discuss their battle plans. And she is actually upstairs with um, an enslaved woman named Luki, um, uh, essentially eave eavesdropping on, on their, uh, their meeting to find out what's happening uh, with their plans. Um, I should also mention that Luki is played by uh, a legendary pr uh, professional pen tennis player um, named Althea Gibson. And uh, so Major Kendall discovers that they're spying on them. And uh, because of that, they feel that they can't trust these women to be left behind with the, the battle plan. So they force them to come along um, on you know, the, the rest of the, uh, the, the raid. And uh, I don't want to spoil too much of the film, but um, the, the rest of the film takes us through uh, some different battles that, that ensue along the way. And also, um, while Miss Hunter's character is initially very hostile to, um, to uh, John Wayne's character, uh, over time their relationship develops a bit more and she eventually uh, actually like falls in love with him. Um, again, I don't want to spoil the, the ending. <laughs> so Brian, I know that you're kind of a history buff, especially a Civil War buff. So tell me, like films like this that we see that talk about the Civil War, how, how historically accurate are these? Can we believe this verbatim, or should we be taking this with a grain of salt? Um, I, I would say take it with a grain of salt. Um, I mean, there, there is certainly some historical basis for uh, things that you see in the film, but they also take some liberties with things and bring in things that, that weren't an actual part of this uh, particular campaign. So, uh, for instance, Colonel Marlowe, uh, John Wayne's character, is a former uh, railroad construction engineer. Uh, the, the real Colonel Grierson that he is sort of loosely based on was actually a former music teacher who uh, incidentally hated horses because he got kicked in the head by one as a child. So that's a little bit different from the, the usual image that we have of John Wayne as this you know stalwart guy on, on a horse and all of that. Um, the other thing too, uh, while uh, William Holden's character is again loosely based on a real person, um, 
uh, Constance Towers' character is just a complete made up, yeah, fabricated. Up yeah, exactly. So but, this sounds a lot to me like this sounds almost more like a Civil War movie. How is would you, how do you consider this? How is this considered a western? Um, well, I, I guess first of all, I should mention that um, even though this isn't happening in the far west, you know, Arizona, Nevada, something like that, um, it, it's happening in you know Mississippi, uh, Louisiana. Um, that is actually considered the Western theater of the Civil War. So um, it's a little bit different from what we might tend to think of as the West, but, but that was the West. Um, the other thing too is that, um, as is common in many of John Wayne's uh, Westerns, he, he plays this very stoic, masculine, strong kind of figure. Um, so it's uh, very similar to, to what you see him playing in, in his other films. And, um, Similar to Westerns, uh, there's often this kind of absence of uh, the usual sort of social order, the, the kind of justice system that, that we tend to think of um, in sort of civilized society. Um, in a lot of Westerns, that's usually uh, portrayed as uh, you know, frontier justice or people taking justice into their own hands. With this film, um, it, it comes up as just sort of the, the lawlessness that happens in war and the, the lack of order that, that there is in wartime. Um, and also, that a lot of Westerns have uh, sort of the harshness of the frontier and things like that. And in this, it's the harshness of, of war and the, the hellishness that happens um, in, in wartime. Um, we also often see uh, in Westerns kind of this cowboys versus the outlaws, this right. sort of feud that happens, and there's really no bigger feud in American history than the American Civil North War. North versus the South. Yeah, and um, so in, in this film, our sort of cowboys are, are the Union soldiers, and they just so happen to be Union cavalry, so it, it very much is this kind of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, people on horseback. Um, and yeah, the outlaws in, the, in this case are the Yeah, so the nice a parallel there. So you mentioned John Wayne. So I don't think you can talk about uh, Westerns without talking about John Wayne. He's, you know, the prototypical Western, um, classic Western character, uh, 142 Westerns he was in, 14 of which he was in with, or at least 14 films he was in with John Ford. So tell me a little bit about John Ford, the John Ford, John Wayne relationship. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, one thing that's interesting to mention about John Ford is that he once said that the Civil War was actually his major interest in life, not, not making films. Um, but despite that fact, this was the only full-scale film that he ever made about the Civil War. It, it was kind of tangential in some other films that he made, but this is the only one that is truly dedicated to uh, the, the topic of the Civil War. Um, and so John Ford had this kind of uh, mentor relationship with, with John Wayne, but during the making of this film, they actually didn't get along very well um, because uh, Ford was a longtime alcoholic and he had been ordered by his doctor prior to the making of this film to give up alcohol, you know, no more, no more drinking. And, um, and he did comply with this, but he was very angry about it and took out his anger on the cast and the crew and John Wayne happened to get the worst of, of his treatment um, to the point that he actually demanded that John Wayne also be completely sober for the, the whole making of it, even though John Wayne was not under doctor's orders to do so. Um, and so John Wayne sort of conspired with the, the producer of the film to like, you know, get me away from here <laughs> and uh, because Ford was really keeping, keeping watch on him. And so um, uh, the producer and John Wayne, William Holden, actually went on this like secret drinking trip in New Orleans and, uh, and Ford had his spies and, and found out about it and was very angry at them whenever he found out about it. But um, although Ford, did, as I said, did remain sober during the production, he immediately fell off the wagon at, at the end of it because um, uh, stuntman Fred Kennedy, who was a, a, a friend of uh, John Ford's, actually um, died in, in filming one of the, the scenes. He fell off a horse and broke his neck. And um, at that point, uh, John Ford was just devastated and kind of gave up on the film. They stopped location shooting. Uh, they didn't even finish the, the, the last part of the story where they, they go on to, uh, to New Orleans, or to Baton Rouge, rather. Um, and again, I don't want to give, give away the ending, but they, they didn't like take the, the story the whole yeah. way to completion. That's terrible. Yeah. That's, a, that's a shame, but you know, I think John Wayne was uh, sort of John Ford's whipping boy, even in the best of conditions, much less when he was trying to remain sober. But thank you, Brian. We appreciate your historical expertise. Next up, we have our friend and frequent guest, Kirk. 
Hi, Kirk. What Western do you want to talk about? Hi, Wendy. Uh, thanks for having me back again. Yes. Fill in a dress. I don't. Absolutely. The, I'm, not, I'm not in uh, costume. And I don't That's have, okay. I'm not off necessary. theme. Yeah, I'm ready for uh, like beach blanket movies or yeah, something like not, that. Yeah, well, maybe that will be our next next show. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Um, no, I, the movie I want to talk about today was uh, The Oxbow Incident yeah. from 1943, directed by uh, William A. Wellman, who's best known as the director of Wings, I think, the first uh, Best Picture winner. Uh, and this is a movie, it's, a, um, it's about a small town where uh, it stars uh, Henry Fonda. Uh, he's coming back into town uh, after he's been away for a while, and he's already on edge. Uh, his his uh, his sweetheart has kind of left him, abandoned him, and he's kind of coming. He's got a chip on his shoulder, and as he's coming in, what also happens is it's found out that one of the uh, one of the uh, frontiersmen living near the town that all these people know has been murdered, and so um, it, now it's a matter of you know what do we do? We got to go find the people who killed him, and uh, it's kind of a perfect storm the situation of the wrong people to handle this. And to deal with this, uh, you have you know you have a deputy, the sheriff's out of town. Sheriff's out of town. You have a deputy who is mostly concerned about proving his authority and that he's uh, it's okay for him to do this. Uh, you have a close friend of the of the victim who just wants to, who's, who's seen red and wants revenge. Uh, you have a uh, a former uh, Confederate major mm. who is uh, who is just real you know he's a real war hawk. He wants to, he wants to get these guys and he he has a son who is, he sees as kind of weak you know not, you know kind of a sissy. And uh, he wants to kind of make a man out of him, use a situation for that. So you have all these people who are in it for the wrong reasons, and they're going out to hunt down these uh, presumed killers. Uh, so they go out, and uh, they're on the road, and they eventually come across a group of people who there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that, yeah, they may be the killers, but there's also a lot of reason to believe they not, might not be. So uh, Henry Fonda does what he does best. He argues against the mob to do the right thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting movie about um, just what is, uh, you know, what is justice. And the reason I love it is because it's a revisionist Western in a time period where revisionist Westerns really weren't a thing yet. What, what is, tell us what you mean by revisionist Western. Yeah, revisionist Western is basically, uh, I don't want to say it questions the genre itself, but it asks questions of the genre. You know, it kind of subverts the tropes, it subverts the, the themes. Um, it's, it goes against the idea of, you know, good versus evil, white hats versus black hats. The line's a little more blurred. It's a little more, you know, it's a lot, deals a lot more with the gray areas and a little lot more realistic. And I mean, that's past 20, 30, 40 years, that's really all that gets made. You really couldn't make a, a traditional Western these days. Um, but back then in the 1940s, when, you know, Westerns were at their height, yeah. You were you still had very much the black hats versus the white hats, and it, you know any other movie at this time period, you know it's hey, uh, you know somebody got killed, we know who the bad guys are, let's go get them. Right. And, Usually these posse's are like formed by with legal yeah by legal mm -hmm. entities and and the marshal and you know like in Three Ten to Yuma, yeah. the marshal and they form a posse and they go get the bad guys. Mm -hmm. In this case, they're forming a posse without the proper legal person mm -hmm. um, and they're getting people but we don't they're not necessarily the bad guys we don't know exactly yeah and um, yeah they, they're forming the posse it's, it's it's argued whether or not it's you know legal and who can do it and they but they're doing it they're, right. they, you know they go out they do it and um, yeah it's it's, a, it's very interesting just to see the motivations behind these characters and um, I really like the idea of it 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 looks at these characters and it the people aren't what they seem, you know. What I mean, like they have like the, the they put out a lot of bravado, you know. The, the the posse, hey, I want to be the one that hangs them. I want to, I want to get these guys, and then when rubber hits the road, a lot of them back off. Yeah, you really see like the char all almost all the characters, individual personalities coming out here mm -hmm. and there. Like, I mean, you're kind of swept up in this mob mentality. Like, mm -hmm. this is definitely like a mob mentality. It's it's like almost you can see them. They should be running around with pitchforks and like um, torches. You know, mm -hmm. they're 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 determined to go do this. They're so angry, but you get these characters that you know every all these characters are so defined and you have these different kind of characters in there we're not just talking about oh here's the guys that are cowboys you have these other kind of characters talk about some of these other characters within this film yeah there are a lot of different characters and you you, you see the separation like you see this um this idea of a uh, repression or rejection or fear of the person who is different you know who is the other like you have um there's one of the pr people who unwillingly goes along uh, is is the town preacher who's mm -hmm. African American, mm -hmm. and there's he's kind of kept at arm's length from the rest of the group. And in this situation, it's because he's against the posse, 
but you get the feeling that that's kind of how he's treated all the time. Right, because you know? he, when you first see him, he's kind of sitting there alone on the porch. And if mm -hmm. you, I don't know if you notice when they first show him and they first start call, talking to him and saying, you should come along, preacher. Mm -hmm. In the background, as soon as you see his character, they start playing like this gospel music. Yeah for his character mm -hmm. um, and, and it, like again he's sitting all alone he's, yeah. he seems to be it's almost like saying he is an outcast exactly yeah and they really it, it, they bring him in and there's some conversation uh, he has with other characters talk about how his brother was lynched so it really brings a, a different you know perspective a different you know light on the idea of lynching and, and the seriousness of that what that means especially right. when it's done this way with that mob mentality uh, you also have, uh, I mentioned the Civil War uh, major, mm -hmm. uh, he's bringing his son along and he, his son is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hinted that he might be gay, um, you know, but it's, there's also a, uh, it's, it, whatever, whatever reason, he, he, the, the father doesn't see him as, as man enough. And, and he says that numerous, he yeah. says it in the mm -hmm. film, like, you, you know, you're, you're not, something along the lines of like, or you make you a man or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and of course we're talking about a film that is after the production code, so you can't like say outright so it, if it is hinting mm -hmm. at, but uh, you know since you mentioned that you know you can see that maybe that is a hint that he was homosexual yeah and, and you get the idea that that's at the core of it is what the father's afraid of yes and um so you see so again this is another character who's you know he's we see him as a good guy because he doesn't want to be a part of this violence part of this right. mob um, but they look down on him because of you know because again he's he's separate from them. He's yeah, and he's them. also uh, you know he doesn't behave manly mm -hmm. like the rest of the people. Sure. He's like afraid of you know blood. He he doesn't want to do any violence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just you know the father, yeah. <laughs> the father has to be the most despicable character oh, yeah. in the whole film. Just mm -hmm. awful. Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, he, he's the one, he's really the driving force. Mm -hmm. There's a few moments in the movie where you see that the, the crowd might be really ready to back off, and he's always the guy driving the issue. He's the one saying, no, 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 we gotta do this, we gotta get this done. And it's much more, I mentioned Henry Fawn, and I you know, kind of you know, talked about 12 Angry Men. It's, yep, very you have similar. that same, very same kind of character where, where you, you push and you push and you push, and you know, he, I, we gotta get these people, we gotta get them, they're the bad guys. But then when you get to the core of it, it's all about his personal issues with his son. Yeah. So that's, that's, Henry Fonda crusading for yeah. right just in another film. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, very well done by Henry Fonda. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have too uh, in this film, a very early film, I think, for Anthony Quinn yeah. playing this sort of, uh, again, another outcast type character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he plays one of the uh, prisoners, one of the suspects, and he's even, there's, it's, a, it's a, a group of three people that they're suspecting, and Anthony Quinn, even among this group, is, is an outsider. There's a, a, at one point, uh, another one of his, of his people try to throw him under the bus and kind of like put all the blame on him, even though they know he's, he's not to blame. And uh, Anthony Quinn's a very interesting character because he is looked at, he's, he's, he's a Mexican immigrant, and you know, he's looked at down on you know, everybody, oh, he's the Mexican, you know right. he did something wrong. He's, I heard he did this and all this and a lot, a lot of hearsay. And it turns out, um, as they go on, he's very educated, he's intelligent, he's thoughtful, he's a very spiritual person, and he's the exact opposite of what they thought, and he's the exact opposite of what all these other people are. Where they're, they're acting in ignorance, you see a lot of thought, intelligence coming from him. Yeah, and, um I mean, it's no, it's notable the characters in this film, like the actors. There's a lot of char great character actors in this film. You mm -hmm. have Harry Morgan, you have Henry Davenport, you have Jane Darnell. Yep. I mean, you have you have Dana Andrews. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of really great actors. This is almost. I mean, I hate to keep drawing the parallels to Twelve <laughs> Twelve yeah. Angry Men, but this is such an ensemble cast. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, it's a short movie. It's only like 75 minutes long. But all these characters are given a chance to shine. They all, they all kind of, the actors of this, this great cast all kind of bring something to the table, you know, and make you feel like this isn't just, it's, there's nobody just like, you know, townsfolk number one yeah. who, who gets dragged along. Everybody is there for a reason. Everybody has uh, a personality and a, and a motivation for being involved. There's in a lot of, a lot of close-ups. Yeah. Like whenever any characters, whatever character is talking, you see like the real close-up of them and you, mm -hmm. you get like these, uh, you get a real sense of everybody, even that ridiculous character and I'm not sure who plays him offhand, the one that keeps wanting to like, yeah. eh, you know, mm -hmm. like it's so annoying, that guy's so annoying too. Yeah. But how, how do these, how does the Oxbow incident, what are some of the Western themes that make this a Western? I think it's um, that idea of, you know, there, there is that self-governance idea, you know, like we are going to take care of this ourselves. We're here on our own. 
you know, we're, we're, we're you know, that kind of American ideal of, of we're going to the dark side of that American deal uh, ideal that we're going to take care of this ourselves. We can we can handle this. You know, we don't need the judge. We don't need the sheriff. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. We'll do this ourselves. And you even see that with the um, you know the, the characters that you know the character who's killed is a is a is, is a frontiersman. He's on a ranch. He's out there by himself. And that is what kind of causes some of the trouble is that there's not enough communication between them. But that that self reliance and that kind of like and there's also that um, again being revisionist Western that take of Western masculinity of like you know this is what a man does this is what men do this is how we handle it so I, th I think that brings those Western ideas in but again puts it in a different light really makes you question them yeah and there's a the, there's a twist. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a big twist that makes things very different. You know, it, it kind of just blows everything out of the water. Yeah. Um, that you don't see coming at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you've seen this film before, you don't sure. expect this twist. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the Oxbow Incident, uh, absolutely a great film. Um, but if we're talking about, since we're talking about, if you don't mind, That's since right. we're talking about revisionist westerns, um, I don't think we can talk about westerns without talking just a little bit about uh, spaghetti westerns, yeah, definitely. right? Mm -hmm. So spaghetti westerns called that because of, well, Sergio Leone is probably the most known, but basically these westerns were produced by Italian producers. They're usually very low budget. Mm -hmm. Again, re revisionist type westerns, they're very, very violent. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's the one thing that I was a little surprised about. I mean, we're talking now we're in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about specifically, when we're talking about Sergio Leone, we're talking about his trilogy, which is um, uh, for a few dollars more, um, a fistful, fistful of dollars and the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. right? So those are his three big films and Clint Eastwood and all of them. So you have this sort of, now these Westerns, have, they don't have a hero, right? Mm -hmm. This is an anti-hero. Um, and Clint Eastwood, he, he plays this sort of very dirty, scruffy character. He's got mm -hmm. this poncho. He's um, he, he's a bounty hunter most of the time. Like he's not he's not like our hero guy. Yeah. So what do you think appealed to people about this particular kind of western? Well, I think you see that in cinema in general. You know, mid to late sixties, definitely going to the seventies. You see more of that anti-hero idea coming out that becomes more popular. I think you know you don't see. Um, you know, people don't want that clean-cut guy anymore. They want somebody who's a little rougher on the edges. And I think Eastwood, you know, he does he did westerns, he did war movies, he did you know cop cop and robber movies where he played that kind of character. I think he was the perfect fit for that time. Um, but I think that's really the appeal of that is just that kind of guy who's kind. Of, he's he, you know the, people didn't want the safe hero anymore. They wanted somebody who's a little more dangerous. And I mean, you can't talk about these those particular spaghetti westerns without talking about the theme music, sure. um, Enya Morricone. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like that um, whistle and all these sort of different um, elements, like these western sounding elements. The, the, mm. These soundtracks are very well known and famous, yeah. and they really do a lot for the film. Um, what do you think? Uh, talk a little bit about what you think about these sort of. Oh, I, I I love Morricone's soundtracks. I mean, I think he's known for a uh, for that for that very unique sound, kind of like different. Uh, you know, talking specifically about uh, a few dollars more. Mm -hmm. uh, the soundtrack for that is just it's it's borderline experimental. You know, there's one specific scene where there's a shootout. It's one of the most tense scenes and violent scenes in the movie, where um, there's a shootout. Two guys are going to start. And uh, they have a little uh, pocket, a pocket watch, watch that makes it has yeah. like a music box, dun, yeah, dun, a little dun, tune dun. in it, yeah. yeah. So that, and that's going to be their start of their, their when the mm -hmm. music stops, they're supposed to start shooting. So the music stops, and the two guys they have that great, you know, Leone stare off with the eyes and everything. And then the 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 the, the, the what pocket watch is playing, and the score picks up, and it starts out as very heavy, like acoustic guitar, almost sounds electric. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, you get this gothic or organ, burr, 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 you know, and it just. It's like he's just throwing the kitchen sink at this, you know, just everything he can. Then you have the, the vocals, you have the chorus, you have the whistling, you have the more traditional Western sounding. But it's just like he's, it, you imagine him in the studio just was surrounded by all these different things. And, you know, what's it, let's do a washboard, see what that sounds yeah. like, let's do the organ. And, um, yeah, it's just a great effect. It really adds to the, to the chaotic feel of these movies. It, it does add. And when we're talking mm -hmm. about For a Few Dollars More, um, I really love particularly that film because uh, I like the idea of the two bounty hunters kind mm -hmm. of teaming together and you have like such different characters and uh, you know I, don't 
hate me for this, but I love Lee Van Cleef in that movie more than I love Clint mm -hmm. Eastwood. I think Lee Van Cleef is the greatest character in that film. Yeah. And I love how he's like this professional guy, Colonel Mortimer, you mm -hmm. know, he's got a suit, he's got these really fancy kind of guns, and Clint Eastwood's like this young, and he, you know, he's older. Clint Eastwood's like this young, ragged guy. He's got a poncho, you mm -hmm. know, he, yeah. he's got like a, almost like a sawed off shotgun or something, mm -hmm. you know. And it's just like, you get this like mentor relationship between yeah. Van Cleef and Eastwood and you know he, Van Cleef goes throughout the film is like tricking him and and mm -hmm. like and, and and so forth and it's, it's just a really cool relationship and I think that's what makes that film a, definitely special is that sort of like weird partnership yeah definitely have. um I think you know I think Cleef, uh, Van Cleef is a star. I'm pretty sure he's top build um, so yeah, I, I think he, his character is the is the star of this movie. But yeah, I love those two, and I love his introduction. You know, they see he's on the train, he's reading that big Bible, he's dressed as a priest, um, so, and he you know how he just forces his way off the train. Uh, but no, I, I think that those two conflicting styles. First of all, the one's very you know methodical, uh, thinks everything out, and Eastwood's kind of just like a shoot first kind of guy, and just the, the one upsmanship you see between them, where they yeah. you know they kind of become friends. Uh, but they have that professional relationship where they're 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 still looking out for themselves, and they don't they, they definitely don't trust each other. Yeah, like yeah. that scene where Clint Eastwood keeps shooting his. Hat. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. That's a great scene <laughs> where knocking his yeah, hat away. Talk about that for a bit where they where they first meet and they just kind of like because they've kind of been uh, circling the same people because they're yes. both bon they're body killers, not really hunters. They're never yeah. called they're killers, uh, and. Uh, so they've kind of been circling the same criminals that they've been hunting. And they, they know each other's there, but they haven't met yet. So they meet and they just face off. And I think Eastwood's the first one to do it. He just kind of like steps on his boot, like scuffs his boot. Yes, and then he, he does, does. It back. And they back off. And um, Van Cleef takes his hat off. And just real <laughs> petty move. Yeah. Eastwood just keeps shooting it away from him. And then uh, to one up him, uh, you know, Van Cleef shoots the hat off his head and just keeps shooting up in the air. So it's a great. I saw, I saw someone call it a meat cute on, <laughs> online, um, but it's a great way, just an introduction of, of this relationship. And it's a great. Uh, it's it's the way the relationship plays out where the two of them are um, always at odds, uh, but finding that common ground to to get what they want. And you have a villain in this um, played Ramon is the character's name. This. The, an Italian actor actually, mm -hmm. from what I understand, spoke no English at all, had mm -hmm. to learn all his lines in English phonetically, um, just plays this just such despicable guy. Like this guy has like, you, you don't get a redeeming quality from this mm -hmm. guy. And it's really interesting because you're going on the film, you're seeing these things happening, but little by little you're getting these little flashbacks to something that's happened in the past. And when you see these flashbacks, you're starting to understand more why what has happened, why the characters are behaving, how they're behaving. So in a way, you know, in a way there's a noirist element to this too, like with the flashbacks and, sure. and you know, the way, why the characters are behaving, where they're behaving. And you find out, you, you think one thing again. You're again thinking one thing, the characters are behaving this way because of this. Mm -hmm. They're bounty hunters. But then you find out that one of them isn't, that isn't the real reason. Yeah. And you don't find out till the very end of the film, and by then you've seen all the flashbacks, so now you know where you're at. Yeah, you get the full picture. Um, yeah, the villain, uh, his name was, do you remember his name? The, the character name? I don't remember. The, his his name. character name is Ramon. Ramon, Ramon. okay, yeah. He, um, he was so good. Like, he has like that, he looks very Italian. He has that great look. Yes. He's got that big bushy He beard. doesn't look Mexican. No, he doesn't. No. Well, <laughs> he no, plays a Mexican character. You know, I'll say that about these spaghetti <laughs> westerns. One thing I, I love about him is that it's so, there's like this otherworldly feel to him. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, you're supposed to be in America, but you can tell you're not in America. Yes. They're supposed to be Americans and Mexicans, but you can tell they're not Americans and Mexicans. Yes. And it just has this really, it just it makes this really great, like, only in the movies kind of feel to it. Um, but yeah, perfect example with him, he's got that beard, those piercing mm -hmm. eyes. Um, the eyes. He's very, you know, very charismatic, um, but he's just bloodthirsty and yeah. evil and evil. Just, just merciless to you. Some of the stuff you see him do in this movie, like he just does not care. And uh, he's that perfect kind of villain that you want to see. And you need, when you have, you know, heroes who are kind of on the edge, the anti-heroes, you need a bad guy yeah. that you can root against 100%. Exactly. And that's, that's, you know, that's definitely what he is. Yeah, so anyhow, like, I I would highly recommend people, like, mm -hmm. checking out these Italian Westerns, these spaghetti Westerns, um, and all Westerns. Kirk, it's always a pleasure to chat with you about classic film.
And it's all the time we have for today. I really enjoyed talking about Westerns with you and hope that our viewers have enjoyed the show. And remember, if you want to be a guest on the show, you simply have to follow Wendy's Classic Corner on Facebook or email me at wendysclassiccorner at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Wendy from Wendy's Classic Corner saying so long and here's looking at you, kid. The way we Why go anywhere else for classic movies?